Today, I'd like to introduce Michael Robertson from Yorgos Skinios' group at Stanford, and he's going to be talking about GemSpot, a pipeline for robust modeling of ligands and priority at maps. And so with that, Michael, take it away. Uh, okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting this together uh, and inviting me to talk to you today about my work uh, modeling ligands into Cryo maps in the Skinios lab. So in the Skinnerus lab, we do a lot of cryem with uh, different liganded uh, biomolecular complexes. So for example, this was a, a structure published in 2017 of the Leishmania ribosome bound to the antiparasitic compound permamycin. Uh, and then on the right, you have the uh, cannabinoid 1 receptor bound to uh, this recreational cannabinoid compound of Fubinaca. Uh, and kind of the, one of the main interests in the lab is trying to push towards doing structure-based drug discovery with cryo-EM. But obviously a, a key part of this is that you need to be able to model the ligand very accurately. And when it comes to cryo-EM, there are a couple of challenges uh, compared to crystallography. So first of all, uh, obviously in the case of crystallography, you're looking at a crystalline phase measurement where everything is packed into an ordered lattice, whereas in uh, cryo-EM, you're doing a solution phase measurement of just the conformational ensemble of things in solution. Uh, you have various other differences. So for example, you know, in crystallography, the uh, scattering factors are relatively insensitive to atomic charge, which isn't really the case in cryo-EM. You know, generally speaking, the cryo map so far, while people are pushing to higher and higher resolutions, is still relatively low by structure-based drug discovery standards. Um, so it seems like you oftentimes have cases too in cryo where even if you have a very good uh, local protein resolution, the resolution of the ligand is oftentimes relatively you know poor by comparison. Um, Additionally, you know, it can be quite difficult to detect things like water molecules or tell the difference between a water molecule and just dust in the map. Um, you also can't use some of the tricks that are available in crystallography for modeling ligands. So you can't, you know, since in the case of cryo you're measuring experimentally both phases and amplitudes, you know, you're not really cooking up things like the omit map to help you model ligands into density. Uh, so an example of why this is very important, so you can take a look at the case of beta-galactosidase here, which was solved. This is actually the same data set that was processed with two different software. So the first software was a, a pipeline based around the original free line, which went to 2.2 angstroms. Uh, and then later with advancements in the CTF refinement and free line X, they're able to take the same data set to 1.9 angstroms. Uh, and so you can see, well, there's you know, substantial improvement for the density of the ligand, um, the person responsible for the modeling has ultimately decided to change the, the pose of the ligand you can see between these two maps, you know, which is totally understandable because it's still very kind of, uh, you know, not unambiguous as to what the correct pose is here. What we were really interested though in our lab is trying to come up with a way with either of these maps, you could converge to the same pose, it would hopefully be the right pose. Uh, in a way that would be kind of computationally driven and free from modeler bias. Uh, so we worked together with uh, Schrodinger to come up with a pipeline in order to do this, which we now call GemSpot, uh, which we put up on BioArchive in 2019 and is actually now currently available in Structure. Uh, so what this does is it starts basically by performing computational docking with the addition of the uh, EM map as a, a additional restraint. Uh, so you have your ligand of interest and your receptor with the map. You then perform docking to try and look at what's forming a good docking score um, by making favorable interactions uh, and what's also fitting quite well into the map so that you only get poses that have both a good cross correlation with the map and a good score. But then this is coupled to a water placement uh, prediction algorithm, quantum chemistry calculations, and taking a look at SAR data in order to try and build confidence in the pose that you've ended up producing with the GlideM. Uh, and sorry, and additionally, post the GlideM, we're also performing refinement with Phoenix OPLS3E, which is a, a little bit more advanced way of doing the refinement that includes the OPLS3E force field for the ligand in order to help ensure that the kind of geometry of the ligand isn't distorted by the density. 
Uh, so just to go into a couple of what these components are. So docking is a computational procedure where you're taking your ligand of interest and your, your receptor. You're basically drawing a, a cube of where you think the binding region is. And then you're systematically taking your ligand, translating and rotating the ligand and sampling internal degrees of freedom uh, in this cube that you've defined in order to try and identify a pose for the ligand in which favorable interactions are being made with your biomolecule of choice. Um, this is based on a, a semi-empirical uh, score that has th things like, you know, columbic favorable charge interactions, you know, van der Waals packing, are you enclosing, you know, hydrophobic surface area in the receptor and things like this. Uh, so another one of the tools we're using here are quantum mechanics. So the concept here is that uh, while rarely is the actual global minimum energy conformation of a ligand in solution exactly identical to the bound pose of the ligand, it's also extremely rare for the bound pose of the ligand to be extremely high in conformational uh, energy. So by evaluating basically the relative conformational energy of the different poses that you're producing, you can get an idea of, well, if something's, you know, five or six kcal per mole higher in energy than another pose, it's probably relatively unlikely. Uh, and then finally, we're also including some water prediction calculations, and these are done with jaw simulations in the GemSpot pipeline. So what this is, is it's a Monte Carlo simulation in which you're, you're hydrating the binding site around the ligand, uh, and then over the course of the uh, simulation that you're performing, if it's energetically favorable to have a water there, the water will be sampled on. If it's energetically favorable to not have a water there, the water will be sampled off. And then by basically looking at the percentage of the time that a water is sampled in a given position, it will predict if there should be a water at that position. Uh, and so in the process of developing this, we were able to make it into a relatively true pipeline where you just have to prepare your PDB with the ligand just roughly in the pocket that you think it belongs to. You then prepare the system with the Schrodinger's uh, Maestro software, uh, and then the GemSpot script will perform the docking with the QM map, um, the refinement in Phoenix Opus 3E, and the quantum mechanics, and it will also spit out uh, output that can be used with these two other scripts uh, in order to automatically prepare the JAWS calculation. So this is a relatively um, turnkey solution. So coming back to the beta galactosidase example, uh, we wanted to see how the pipeline that we developed would perform. Um, so you can see here in teal are the deposited maps for uh, 5A1A and 6CVM uh, with the the deposited models with the associated maps. Uh, and so you can see in the GemSpot pipeline, we're getting pretty consistently poses that look a lot like the actually original 5A, 1A pose um, with the sugar ring oriented with the uh, oxygen facing this way. Uh, and just as an additional comparison, you can see what happens if you perform the docking without the uh, experimental map as a restraint. So you can see that you're getting poses that aren't really agreeing with the density very well compared to when you use it as a restraint. Okay, and then so if we also take a, take a look at some of the different poses that are being produced here and the relative energies. Um, so this right here is the pose for 5A1A, and this is the pose for 6CVM. And so you can see that if you do the quantum mechanics uh, energy calculation, you know, this pose that was originally in 5A1A and is very similar to the gem spot poses are all pretty much uh, about 1K per mole or less higher energy than a global minimum that looks like this. Um, and the confirmation is quite similar, whereas this pose right here is actually not a global minima. So there's some confirmational strain in this torsion right here, uh, which is actually about 4K per mole higher in energy. So this is also, energetically speaking, a relatively unlikely pose. Um, and so to kind of dig into how this uh, may have happened as far as the manual modeling is concerned, so if you take a look at the water prediction algorithms, um, you can see that it's very nicely predicting uh, here. So these triplicate red spheres are from triplicate runs of the water prediction algorithms. Uh, the teal kind of crosses are where real space refined water is based on the predictions ended up. So you can see that we're predicting the hydration of this magnesium ion very well. 
Uh, and then additionally, though, you can see that this little bit of density that's kind of continuous with the density for the ligand um, is actually predicted to be a water molecule. Um, OK. And then so in a lot of cases, you're obviously not going to have a high resolution crystal structure of an analogous compound. But this is also the case for uh, beta galactosidase. There's this very high resolution crystal structure with a compound that has an identical uh, sugar ring, but just then a different constituent off of here. Uh, and so if we compare the um, 5A1A pose, the top docked pose, uh, and this high resolution crystal structure, you can see that they all have the sugar oriented in roughly the same way. And in fact, this crystal structure also has a water molecule positioned right here where the water prediction algorithm suggests it should be. So we would suggest that this is the correct pose and that this should have the sugar ring flipped. Uh, and this is just a, a side view of this showing again some of the nice fit of the ligand to the map. So we've used this on a wide variety of systems to help benchmark it uh, at, at various different ranges of resolutions and in pretty much all cases. Here the teal is the structure that was deposited in the PDB. You know, oftentimes we're matching very well what people have deposited, and all of these poses are both very chemically reasonable and fit to the density very well. Uh, and so as an additional task, what we wanted to do is take uh, an example where we had a very high resolution map, which was the Leishmania ribosome at 2.7 angstroms, and see if by using smaller and smaller sets of particles, we could produce lower and lower resolution maps if the gem spot pipeline would still work. And you can see going out to even 4.3 angstroms with a very blobby map, um, we're still getting poses that are replacing kind of the two key rings of the permomycin in the correct position. So this is, this is very good to see. Uh, and then we've also extended the pipeline to include peptides with a, a more uh, rigorous sampling algorithm for the peptide. And even here, it's working pretty well for these challenging systems. We've also now applied this to a variety of, of live projects in the lab, and it's, it's worked very well. Uh, we even have a recent preprint up where we solved a, a structure that surprisingly had a lipid bound in the middle of the protein. And even for this very large molecule, the germ spot pipeline worked very well. Uh, so I'd just like to acknowledge a couple people. So in the Skinionis lab, I'd like to thank uh, Yorgo Skinionis for his excellent mentorship uh, on the Schrodinger side of things. So Ken uh, helped out a lot with developing the Gladium, and uh, Gita helped out a lot with the um, uh, refinement OPS3E. Uh, and so you can follow myself and the lab on Twitter at BioPhysicsGuy and Lab Skinionis. Uh, thank you for your time. Hey, thanks, Michael. That was a very interesting talk. Um, if, if folks in the audience have questions, please feel free to send them through chat. Um, I have a couple questions, if sure. we're waiting for ones from the audience to come in. So is, is the, the glide grid orthogonalization something that presents an issue? Like, do you have to worry about lining that up with the cryo-EM grid? Or is that no. less? OK. Not at all. That's a simple answer to a question. Good. <laughs> I guess an, another, another thing that I was wondering about is what happens if you, what you think you have your ligand is, isn't actually the ligand and you put the wrong one in the pocket? So that would be a, a problem. Obviously, you, you... I mean, obviously it's going to do a best fit, but is there going to be a, a sign that, you know, you've got the wrong thing in there? Uh, no, not, not really. Um, unless for whatever reason, you know, it's too big and you, it can't score well, then it's probably going to have a difficulty finding poses that both produce good scores and fit in the map. But you know, if it's a, a subtle difference between the true ligand and what ended up actually being there, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be great at discriminating that. It's, it's really ideally used for ligands where you are pretty confident that you know what the ligand is. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, so now we, we've got a question from Baharat ready? So Baharat, I'm going to unmute you and you should be good to go. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, so let's say you have a protein that's C4 um, and you have one ligand per um, subunit in the C4. Do you have to treat each one independently or will the script deal with all of them at the same time? 
Uh, so it's a good question. Uh, currently, we're just treating it independently and then using the symmetry to generate the other, you know, three copies. Um, is it, have you looked at like, for example, um, breaking how these ligands can potentially break the symmetry at all? Um, so you're gonna say we haven't really had a whole lot of cases where you know, we, we have symmetry occurring with a, a high resolution ligand bound in every copy. Um, so it's not really something we've, we've explored personally. All right. Thank you. And our, our next question we have is from Jeffrey Willard. So Je Jeffrey, you should be unmuted. Okay, so my question is what happens when the ligand is in uh, two poses? Um, cause you talked about, you know, the correct pose. So if, if there's, let's say, I don't know, 50% share probability, would you maybe some of the, if some of the density was, was there, some was blurred out or so what happens in practice in these cases where there might be more than one pose for the ligand? Well, so in, in principle, the, the default settings for the pipeline are, actually basically generating the top five poses. Um, so it's very possible and I would hope that it would, it would in, in essence generate both possibilities and then you would you know, look through and see both of those and hopefully be able to figure it out. Um, you know, obviously if it's say a very low resolution map with two 50-50 poses, it, it might struggle to identify, you know, okay, there's two things going on here. Um, but generally speaking, the weight of the map is actually usually pretty light um, it, it's more to rule out uh, bad, like, like poses that maybe make some chemical sense, but just aren't in the map at all, really. Um, so I, I think it's very possible that, it, that the algorithm could still pick it up, but it, you know, potentially could be a challenge depending upon how the map looks like. But, you know, ultimately, when yeah, you're you have to have enough density to fit to, to, to those poses. Yeah, but... So ultimately, when you're running this, you're, you're requesting, like I said, usually at least five poses. You can request as many poses as you'd like. So you can, you can dig into this kind of thing with the pipeline. OK, thanks. And I guess a, a follow-up question from that. You, you'd mentioned the, the weighting between the, the experimental density and the, 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 the glide scoring. How do you handle that weighting? Uh, so there, there are parameters that you define when you're running the scripts. Um, so basically, the, the docking actually has two phases, like a, a rough phase and a, a more fine phase. And so you can actually change the weight at both of those phases. Um, but you, usually, I'm using it, them at relatively the bare minimum. There are only a couple of cases where, so for example, for the Leshmani ribosome, um, we weighted the, the map up a bit because, as it turns out, the, the ligand is, I think, a, a formal charge of like plus five. It's a, it's a highly charged ligand. So with the phosphodiesterate backbone, you can find a lot of top scoring poses where just it matches the charges, basically. So that's a case where we increase the, the weighting to the map a little bit. OK, well, I'm, I'm always curious about that because I've, I've had some experience with low resolution modeling where things try to automatically determine the weighting, and it sometimes goes horribly wrong. But so I'm always curious about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and we, we have another question from Jeffrey Woolard. It was a paper a while ago, years ago, published by I think Bernard Rupp, ligands density trust but verify. And he sort of looked at a lot of in practice how good ligand density is in public structures. So do you have a sense of how good for cryo EM structures? that are published, I don't know, say in the past two years, how good the ligand assignments are in terms of, I don't know, RMSD or some sort of metric. So at the time that we were putting this together, um, we, we looked relatively extensively at most of the ones where I thought there was pretty decent um, density for the ligand, uh, which would be basically the end of or the, the beginning of 2019. Um, and so in that case, you know, it's a little challenging to say because there's no like ground truth in essence. Um, but I, I would say, I think I actually only found maybe 
five or ten percent of the cases where I felt like the ligand was was particularly off. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks again, Michael, for for a great talk.